tēnā koutou katoa, ka mihi māhana ki a koutou i tēnei wā, nō mai haramai ki tēnei kura, te whare wānanga o tākou ki o tautahi. Nō mai haramai ki o whakaro, ki o mahi, ki o whakaro nui mō tēnei kaupapa, mō te future of AI, ka mihi māhana ki a koutou i tēnei wā. Uh, kia ora koutou, my name is uh, Professor Suzanne Pitama and I'm Dean and Head of Campus here at the University of Otago Christchurch and I wanted to extend a warm uh, welcome to you, uh, to our campus I, and thank you for braving quite a chilly, I know it's not raining today but my gosh it's so chilly and so thank you for braving the weather to come and join us this evening. Um, and we're very grateful and you're going to be uh, meet some amazing people who are currently seated on the couch. I kind of always wanted to be on Oprah, so I feel like this is probably the closest I'm going to get to it, um, around this uh, really exciting kaupapa of the future of surgery and where AI fits into that. Um, the uh, waiata that I started this evening with is a very, very old waiata, and it, it talks about uh, when, when we, when we um, are doing our succession planning, who will come in and take the next, the, the next person on the pie? Who will be the next person that follows through on that? Um, and, and will they be able to stick to the values and the truths that we've so closely held on to? And I think um, the, it's interesting that uh, AI can uh, both scare us and excite us but it definitely is a really important part of our succession planning because it's a technology that all future health professionals will you know, be as fluent with as we are with our smartphones or trying to be with our smartphones. Um, and so it's a great opportunity for us to think about the values and principles this evening that we want to continue uh, within the future of medicine, but how we uh, uh, buddy up and work alongside AI with that. So um, I just really wanted again to wish you a warm welcome to our campus. It's exciting to see you all here this evening. Uh, kia ora koutou. And with that, I get to hand you over to our wonderful MC for the evening, uh, Laurelie Mason. Kia ora, Laurelie. Tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome everybody here to the Rolleston Theatre for the second of our four public talks to celebrate Kia Mau, the University of Otago Christchurch's 50th anniversary, showcasing our academic, clinical, and research expertise. Um, my name's Laurie Mason, I'm the communications advisor here on campus. Te tero ki te heki mai, te me tumanako, it means we look to the future with hope. And it's certainly a really exciting time to be entering or practicing medicine, surgery, and in the health science field right now. Health tech advances are rapid, they're impressive. Of course, there is a price tag and affordability issue to consider, especially for Aotearoa New Zealand with our stretched health system and unmet need and inequity of care access. But how do we balance all this? Is it in fact more cost effective to embrace new health tech to save time and therefore money and deliver to a level of patient care which is potentially superior and safer? Absolutely. But this, of course, is all part of the current debate health systems around the world are currently grappling with. We've got a very busy hour um, coming up, hearing expert opinion on all sorts of wonderful health tech, AI, virtual reality, robotics, 3D bone printing, smart implants, O-arms, VR goggles, custom titanium implants, fat grafts, and new scanning modalities which enable doctors to see inside the body like never before. Futuristic technology which could be coming to an operating theatre or a radiology suite near you. We have four fabulous leaders in their field to speak to you tonight. Each of them, Professor Gary Hooper, Professor Tim Eglinton, Professor Tim Woodfield, and Associate Professor Tracy Meltzer will be giving a presentation and this will be then followed by a Q&A session afterwards with what time we have left. So any great questions for the, for the guys, please uh, have a think as they give their presentations. Tracy Meltzer is an Associate Professor in the Department of Medicine here on campus. 
and he's also Imaging Research Manager at the New Zealand Brain Research Institute, NZBRI, here in Christchurch, where he oversees all imaging and is currently involved in a wide range of neurological research ranging from child development to neurodegenerative diseases. Originally from Montana in the US, Tracy completed his PhD here in New Zealand and has been a Kiwi for some time. As well as having won many awards, grants, and having amassed a large body of published research, his prime research focus is on the development and application of MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, and uh, positron emission tomography, PET radiology scanning techniques, to advance our understanding of cognitive de decline in Parkinson's disease. Now, NZBRI's team has established one of the world's largest single center MRI databases of Parkinson's disease patients, and it now, it's now allowing them to investigate whether markers can be detected to signal brain decline before it happens. As Tracy will now explain, exciting advances in scanning technology are at the forefront of all of this. Okay, let's see, can everybody hear me? All right, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Tracy Melzer tōku ingoa. Um, I'm very pleased to be here this evening. Uh, lovely to see you all here. And what I'd like to do to start the evening off is uh, to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is medical imaging. So, I'm assuming that most of us would agree that medical imaging is completely uh, one of the most useful techniques that we see at almost every hospital and clinic worldwide. And one of the reasons for that is probably the actual, the ability to look inside the body in live human beings is, has always been and will continue to be revolutionary, right? Uh, what you see up there is one of the first x-ray images uh, that was ever taken. That was taken in 1895 by Wilhelm uh, Röntgen. Uh, he was the first to produce and then detect x-rays. And that image that you see, although a little bit blurry, uh, is the image of his wife's hand. So you can see the bones in there a little bit. Do I have a... I do. You can see the bones in there, but you can also see her ring, right? So, not bad uh, at all. Uh, and he won the Nobel Prize in 1901 for this, the first Nobel Prize in physics, by the way, uh, and very well deserved. But things have come a long way uh, since those first images. So these are cutting edge CT images, so three-dimensional x-ray images. And this is an image of the wrist. So what you're looking at here is a wrist. So here's the forearm coming up to a small bone in the wrist, and hopefully you can see that that is actually broken there. What you can see over here is we've had a surgeon come in and uh, insert a screw to try and help with the treatment of that, um, of that scan. What I hope you can see from these images is that A, they are incredible images, but the other thing that you may not be able to see, but we can certainly tell when we analyze these images, is that we're getting uh, very much more information than we ever have from x-ray images. Now, these are from the Mars Bioengineering, uh, excuse me, Mars Bioimaging uh, research group here on campus, uh, and they provide these images, and they're using CT to look at a special type of x-ray, a colored x-ray, which gives us this extra amount of information. Now, other types of imaging, uh, as you heard Lorely mention, uh, MRI in particular, magnetic resonance imaging, and this is one of my areas which I, I get quite excited about. So, MRI is uh, an imaging technique which uses powerful magnets and radio frequency waves to create detailed images of the body. It's safe and non-invasive, but one of the other things about it, and I would say it's probably its greatest advantage, is its flexibility. What I mean by that is that if we, um, we can slightly adjust the initial parameters on the scanner, and we can create a whole host of different images. And these different images can tell us about different aspects of brain health. Now, the other thing that you might see from this slide is my slight bias towards a particular organ in the body. And that happens to be the brain. Um, so I apologize for that, but I don't really apologize because brains are amazing. Um, but I think it just highlights the flexibility of MR imaging. Now, just like CT and X-rays, MR imaging has come a long way uh, in the past few years. So the image that you're looking at here is an image that I produced during my PhD here at Otago in 2009. Now, um, you're looking at a brain, uh, an MR brain. So here's the front of the brain, here's the back of the brain. You're looking at that uh, side-on view of my, of my brain there. Now, I spent hours acquiring this image, processing this image, making it look pretty. This is looking at white matter in the, in the brain. Uh, and I was pretty proud of this image uh, in 2009. But as you can imagine, 
things have changed significantly. So this is a cutting edge image, uh, a diffusion MR image. Not only is it a beautiful image, but the information that we get from this image is much more robust. We have quantitative values, much more informative values about both structure and microstructure. So imaging is getting better. I think that we could probably assume that. But what, what now? What comes after this? So there are just few, two quick things that I'd like to talk about, two specific areas that I'm currently interested in. Well, I have lots of interests, but these two fit within a talk. So the first is artificial intelligence or deep learning. Um, just like the rest of society, I'm quite interested uh, in, in AI. And the other is molecular imaging, which I'll just touch on briefly. So what do we mean by deep learning and AI, as you'll hear throughout the talks this afternoon or this evening? So this, these are, are very um, versatile techniques, and they really do provide us with incredible opportunities in medical imaging. So the basic idea is that we train these different algorithms to do a specific task very, very well, and hopefully better than humans can do that task. And we're already seeing applications in medical imaging of AI and deep learning. And some of those are um, listed up here. So people are currently using AI and imaging to help us fix imaging artifacts to make the images look better, to help us reconstruct the images better. So take the images from the scanners and turn them into useful images. We're using AI to speed up the acquisition times of our images. We're using AI to make them have better spatial resolution, better contrast, make them look better, make them more useful. And as part of this, that allows us to then look at uh, identifying lesions uh, in a more uh, consistent and hopefully better way. Another thing that I think is, is really interesting is the use of these AI models to create predictive models of disease and help us think about progression and changes over time in specific diseases. Now, as I mentioned, these applications and algorithms are occurring now, but this really is the early stage of implementation. And so this, this field is ready for, to, to explode, um, even more so than it already has. So I really think we do need to watch this space, and I'm sure we'll hear a bit more about AI uh, and surgery and medicine throughout the evening. But a quick example um, here in Christchurch, uh, looking at knees. So on the left here, um, you have a normal MRI scan of the knee. This is a horizontal slice through the knee. So what you're looking at here is the kneecap, and then left of the knee, right of the knee. This is a standard knee that we would use clinically every day. On the right, we have an AI augmented knee scan. Uh, and there's a few things that you can see here. One is that the resolution is 80% better, and that the time that it took us to acquire this image was 40% faster. So we have better images with more uh, contrast, more information, which help diagnoses. We have faster images, which means that people are in the scanner for shorter amounts of time, which means we can reduce the strain on the health system and the backlog of people who need imaging. And that ultimately leads to reduced costs for everyone. Right? So this is just one small application of AI here in Christchurch, which you can see has quite wide and large ramifications for the health system and for individuals. Right, so the other area that I'd, I'd really like to talk about is molecular imaging. And what do I mean by molecular imaging? Well, this is a, a, an approach to imaging which looks to quantify and visualize biological processes which occur at the cellular and even subcellular level, and to do that in live humans, so people who are actually alive. So um, probably the best example of this is amyloid PET imaging in Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease um, is associated with two main hallmark proteins, or pathologies. One of those is amyloid beta plaques. So we all have beta amyloid in our brains. It's a protein which functions normally most of the time. But in Alzheimer's disease, it starts to misfold. It gets sticky. It clumps together. And it starts to form these beta amyloid plaques, which are then accumulating and deposited in brain tissue and then um, uh, get in the way of function and help and lead to the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Now, uh, and that's just actually what you can see. Here's some tissue of what these actual plaques look like. But we now have a very sensitive PET imaging technique, amyloid PET, which allows us to visualize and identify the deposition of these plaques in vivo. And that's what you see in these two images here. So here on the left, we have what we call an amyloid negative scan. So areas of blue here in the brain are indicating no deposition of beta amyloid plaques. Where here on the right, you can see all this brain tissue in red indicating high levels 
of beta amyloid, which you'd expect to see in a condition like Alzheimer's disease. Now this is really important, even more so now, because we have two drugs which are approved by FDA to clear amyloid from the brain in the context of Alzheimer's disease. And as recently as a few weeks ago, a third drug was actually published, and that looks to be the best drug yet in terms of clearing amyloid um, in Alzheimer's disease. So this becomes really important because A, we need to be able to identify in a consistent and accurate way who has amyloid in the brain so we know who to treat. We also need to know who does not have amyloid in the brain because we know these new treatments have side effects, so we don't want to ex expose those people to those potential side effects. And lastly, this also now gives us a nice objective, quantitative metric of how well the treatment is working. We can tell whether these new anti-amyloid drugs are clearing amyloid from the brain. An amyloid PET is just the tip of the iceberg. We can get our chemistry right, and we can, um, again, have some flexibility here. We can look at different proteins. We can look at specific cancer cells. We can look at even different cell types and things like inflammation using molecular imaging with PET. So the future is quite bright for molecular imaging, and I'm quite excited to see how that actually influences clinical care in the short, medium, and long term. And so lastly, i just leave you um, with another nice MR image and say, uh, just give you a reminder that imaging is incredibly beneficial, and I think it's enormously, uh, has an enormous potential for the future. Uh, so with that, kia ora, um, and thank you very much. That's wonderful. Thanks so much, Tracy. Well, um, Professor Tim Eglinton is a consultant colorectal and general surgeon and head of our Department of Surgery here at the University of Otago, Christchurch. He's been a busy surgeon working both publicly and privately in Christchurch since 2008 and is one of the South Island's foremost laparoscopic colorectal surgeons. As head of the Department of Surgery, Tim has a strong research interest in diverticular disease and inflammatory bowel disease and improving the lives of patients with colorectal cancer. He's published over 100 papers and texts and received an impressive number of distinctions and awards. As a senior surgical specialist, Tim's also heavily involved in training young surgeons in Christchurch and all through Australasia, where the use of robotics and other high tech is gathering pace. Well, kia ora koutou and uh, welcome. Thank you, Lauralee. And thank you all for coming this evening to listen to us talk about the, uh, the future of surgery. Now I'm going to talk about uh, surgical robotics. I'm going to have a look at where we are now and where we might get to with a focus on my area of specialty, as Laurelly said, is abdominal problems, things like colorectal cancer. So I'm going to look at some of the particular challenges that we face with surgical robotics in the abdominal cavity. Now, but the first challenge I faced tonight, to be honest, was prediction itself. Because as uh, Niels Bohr famously said, prediction's very difficult, especially if it's about the future. Now, prediction in medicine is a really fraught thing. I, a lot of people far more eminent than me have tried to predict the future of medicine and failed miserably. Now, can you imagine if Lord Kelvin was sitting in the audience here listening to Tracy's amazing talk on medical imaging? He'd be a bit red-faced about what he said about x-rays back in the 19th century. And Sir John Erickson, the, the surgeon extraordinaire, he said 200 years ago that surgical progress had peaked. So I think we all know now that surgery's made remarkable progress over that period. In Sir John Erickson's time, if you got a diagnosis of bowel cancer, that was a death sentence. Even if you think about it, in the early part of the 20th century, if you had an operation for bowel cancer, you had more chance of dying from that surgery than surviving it. That's quite a statistic. I mean, nowadays with our modern keyhole surgery, the outcomes are obviously much, much better. But they're still not, not perfect. And most recently we've seen the introduction of these surgical robots. So that's where you have a surgeon sitting at a console operating robotic arms remotely. And this is certainly, this has increased our, our accuracy, our vision and our precision. But I say robots in inverted commas because there's actually no, the surgeon's still doing the whole operation here. There's no input from an autonomous, self-regulating robot. And interestingly, these 
these master-slave robot assisted systems haven't actually shown a massive improvement in patient outcomes. And I wonder, is that because they are still human controlled? Is that because they're prone to human error, distraction, fatigue, and variation? But we now, we really have reached an inflection point, as we've already been talking about, in surgical robotic technology. And I predict that we're probably going to see, within our lifetime, I don't know, maybe maybe the 75th anniversary of USC, maybe the 100th, who knows, but we will see autonomous surgical robots operating. Now, as I said before, prediction is difficult, and so I actually thought, well, I'd better get a second opinion on this. I need someone else to tell me if this is going to be right. So I went to an expert in the field, um, a robot <laughs> itself. I went to chat GPT, and, and this is what it said to me, which is interesting. It's quite a bit more circumspect than I was, isn't it? And then so I thought... I actually thought, well, who else do you go to, well, certainly my generation and many in the audience, if you need tech advice, you go to your teenage children, don't you? So I went to Gus, my teenager, and I showed him this from ChatGPT, and I said, what do you think of this, Gus? And he just looked and said, Dad, he said, don't be silly. That AI knows damn well there's going to be autonomous robots. It's going to steal your job, but it's just not letting on. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess the point I'm trying to get at here, and Terry's already alluded to, is that... We, we really, we've all seen this explosion in deep learning AI models. And it's a sort of a convergence of these technologies now with other things you're going to see tonight, with virtual reality, augmented reality, imaging, and immense processing power that means I think it is feasible we're going to see autonomous robots operating. There we go. So, so how do you actually create a robot that can, can actually plan and perform surgery itself? It seems like an amazingly complex task, doesn't it? And I guess it is. But like many of these things, you, you can break it down to three basic steps. Sensing, processing, and executing. And if you look at all those three areas, robots actually have some advantages over humans in all of them. Human surgeons, like Gary and I, we sense primarily with vision and touch. And robots can do both those, but they can also sense a massive other spectrums that we just can't perceive. Things like x-rays, infrared, and many, many. We now know that robots possess processing power well in excess of anything humans are capable of. I think it's over about five years now since AlphaZero. That was Google's DeepMind AI program. That taught itself to play chess from scratch in less than four hours and then beat the human world champion. So this is the processing power we're dealing with. And finally, executing. Well, really, you're just mechanizing surgical instruments, many of which have been around for hundreds of years that robots can wield these with increased precision. So robots don't have to do the whole procedure. There are levels of control that they can have. And it's probably best understood, I think, in terms of autonomy and self-driving cars. Now, I reckon quite a few of you here tonight probably arrived in cars that had some form of either partial or conditional autonomy operating. They might have had lane assist or cruise control. If you're sort of like an orthopaedic surgeon like Gary, you might have even had a, a late model Tesla or something like that. And, <laughs> and that could have been in full self-drive mode. And that essentially is, is a, a highly or almost fully autonomous robot that's monitoring and responding to its environment. So if you keep that in mind, we can have a look at what's available at the moment in terms of robotic technology. Here we go. So this here is one of the, the first robots or procedural robots in the market that shows a degree of partial autonomy. So with all this amazing cool technology available, what did we humans decide to treat? What life-threatening condition, what horrible cancer? You can actually see it was male pattern baldness. Okay. <laughs> so we worry about AI, but I think we should think a bit more about the fragilities of the human condition at times. But anyway, if you see this robot is actually deciding itself which hairs to transplant and where to put them. But what I want you to look at in that, that, that video is actually that that head is perfectly still, okay? And the robotic technology we've got at the moment is really well suited to things that aren't moving and are non-deformable. Tissues like this and bone that Gary's going to talk to you about in a minute are really good. But we as general surgeons, we have to deal with tissues that are moving or are deformable and squishy. And it's not like we're not kind of like auto mechanics. We can't just turn the car off while we fix it. 
We have to do it while it's running. So one of the biggest challenges that we face operating the chest and the abdomen is how you deal with these expanding, contracting, gurgling, jiggling tissues and try to get a robot to manage those. But it's a challenge we are rising to. This is a robot that is used to treat cancer. So this robot employs preoperative imaging to localise that lung tumour and then through a variety of sensors it monitors the movement of that tumour to really precisely apply the radiotherapy. And teaching machines to recognise soft tissue anatomy is something we've been involved with here at UAC actually. And now I'm sorry, Laurel Lor said in no uncertain terms, don't show any gory pictures. But I just, this one was too cool to leave out, so if you're squeamish, just look away. So this is gallbladder removal, so you've got to take, the surgeon needs to take out the gallbladder, and to do that, he's got to identify two critical structures to divide them and safely remove it. Now this can be actually quite tough, even for experienced surgeons. But with work we've been doing with Medtronic here, this has led to development of this computer vision algorithm that can actually clearly identify those structures in real time for the surgeon. There they are there in green and blue. And I love this because we often, we have our students observing us uh, do these procedures and we often joke with them when we're asking about anatomy. We're sort of saying, look, wouldn't it be nice if the anatomy was colour-coded like a textbook? And there you go, now it is. But the most sophisticated soft tissue robot that is in existence at the moment comes from the Johns Hopkins in the, in the US. So one of the crucial bits of bowel cancer surgery is once you've taken the bowel out, you've got to join those two ends of bowel together. And you've got to do that accurately and precisely. If you don't, there's catastrophic, even fatal consequences for the patient. So this robot can do just that itself. It can autonomously join two ends of bowel together. That video you see up there is the robot planning where it's going to put the stitches and then executing that itself. So this was published in Science Robotics last year with the impressive conclusion that the robotic system could match the performance of expert surgeons but also show an elevated level of consistency compared to human surgeons. So we're making some progress in these technical challenges of automation. But I do wonder if it's the non-technical things, if it's the ethical, the legal and regulatory practices that are going to be more of a challenge for us going forward. We're all aware, and Suze has already alluded to it, of the, some concerns around the rapid dissemination of AI technology and its, and its regulation. And I think Rishi Sunak um, is soon to host a, a global AI safety summit that people are likening to the original Atomic Energy Summit in terms of historical significance. And look, obviously safety is paramount in all robotic um, applications, but in surgery, it's obviously got to be next level. If we go back to self-driving cars, we know that robots are fallible. And what happens if a surgical autonomous robot does make a mistake? Where does that liability sit? Is it with the robot itself? Is it with the manufacturer? Is it with the doctor? These are all questions we need to ponder. And finally, what about job security? I come, I come back to what Gus, my teenager, said. Are the robots going to take over altogether by the time we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the UAC? Well, I think in reality that's unlikely, but as autonomous surgical robots take a greater role in surgery, our role as surgeons is going to evolve more into one of supervision, and coordination. And yeah, I do think robotic technology has got its pitfalls, but if we embrace it correctly, it can achieve our goals of, of reducing variation and human error and improving patient outcomes. And who knows, some even think that um, robotic technology may be a solution to the workforce problem with the ageing population and potentially even the democratisation of surgery at a global level. Thank you. That was um, really fascinating. Thank you very much. Well, Professor Gary Hooper is the University of Otago Christchurch's head of the Department of Orthopaedics and Musculoskeletal Medicine. He specialises in adult elective surgery, mostly joint replacement procedures. There's probably most families in town will have had Gary operating on a member of their family, I'd imagine, at some stage. He leads a very active research group that focuses on outcomes following joint replacements and studies involving bone metabolism 
and musculoskeletal bioengineering. He's also studying how to improve healing rates following fractures, and his, his investigations include the building and production of cartilage scaffolds for the treatment of articular cartilage defects and developing titanium implants to fill bone deficits. His department's responsible for managing the New Zealand Joint Registry, the first registry to generate long-term patient outcome measures. And Gary's been recognised internationally for his re, re, uh, excellence in medical research, as well as for being a highly respected academic and a dedicated teacher of undergrad and postgrad orthopaedic trainees, and is therefore witness to the latest high-tech advances in orthopaedic surgery. Thanks very much, Laura Lee. Um, kia ora, and welcome this evening. Um, so, we want to get rid of the orthopaedic surgeon. So perhaps our medical colleagues were right when they compared us to rhinoceri. <laughs> Little brain, thick hide, and charge too much. <laughs> At least that's what Tim was alluding to, I'm sure. <laughs> but you all know that once you break your bone, you need a bone cut. If you develop osteoarthritis and your joint wears out and it gets creaky and sore, you need a bone carpenter. And so orthopaedic surgeons are your go-to. We have bone carpenters. Very similar to the, our ordinary carpenter, we have to be precise in the things we do. Uh, we don't do much uh, dub and tailing uh, uh, in orthopaedics, but we do have to do procedures where we have precise cuts on bone to create uh, the right outcome. You notice this carpenter here uses a hammer. Well, orthopaedic surgeons have got a range of hammers as well. <laughs> and it's often been said that the harder the procedure, the bigger the hammer. <laughs> and so you can see that the surgeon below has the four of hammers, and obviously that procedure was slightly difficult. In 1963, Sir John Charnley developed the total hip joint replacement which has been a revolutionary outcome for numerous people around the globe. It's been voted the most significant operative surgery of the 20th century and likely to be the most significant operative surgery of the 21st century. It returns people to functional outcome and gets rid of their pain. But because of this, joint replacement surgery in all countries, all developed countries, has become an epidemic. We have an increasing aged population, but this increasing aged population wants to do more than previous aged populations. Your great-grandmother was quite happy at 65 sitting on the porch in her armchair with a cat on her lap and a cup of tea on her lap as well. But our 65-year-olds today want to do this. They want to get out run on the track. They want to at least hike around the great walks. They want to get on their bike and bike 20 k's. Uh, and to do this, we need to facilitate that with joint replacement surgery. I was not going to put many slides in to show results, but this is just something that I'd like to show you because this is important. This is total knee replacement, the results. This is a, what we call a survival curve. So at year zero, 100% of the joints survive. And then when they, by survival, I mean they don't require a further operation. And when they need a further operation, then they get taken off. And so you can see that there's a gradual loss of patients who have not survived. That is, they've required a further operation because their joint replacement has failed. But look at what the results are. So at 22 years, 92% of those joint replacements survive. So this tells me that orthopaedic surgeons in New Zealand are doing a good job. You've got good surgeons here that can do give you world uh, figures which are unbeatable in the rest of the world. So why do we need robots? Why do we need something else within the operative uh, suite? There are two reasons why we should have robots. The first is precision. We can always make our implant position better. We can always make our bone cuts better, etc and also soft tissue protection. They are the two most important things in orthopaedics that we look at uh, with regard to the use of robotic surgery. When implants fail, particularly total knee replacements when they fail, they often fail because of aseptic loosening or infection. Aseptic loosening means that the implant gets loose, 
uh, and has to be replaced. Often that loosening can be a result of imprecise positioning of the implant. So we have developed a lot of robotic surgery within orthopedics. It's not quite as dramatic as the robotic surgery that Tim showed you because he's working with soft tissues all the time. Generally, we're working with bone all the time, so our bony cuts have to be precise. So I'll take you through this. This is a knee replacement surgery. Here's the knee for those that are interested. And surrounding it, there are these arrays which are, which are attached to both the tibia and the femur. Those arrays feed information to the computer screen so the computer can tell you where that knee is in space and what you're about to do. And that's then fed onto the screen. The surgeon can look at the screen, look at the image and say, yes, I want to make my cut there, and then wheel in the robotic arm with the saw attached, and the saw does the cutting. He presses the trigger, so he's involved, yes, and he makes the cut. And these saws often have haptic control, so they pr protect soft tissues as well. So that's pretty much the basis of what we see when we're doing a robotic surgery in orthopedics. Other advantages... Tracy introduced a, a CT scan earlier on. Well, everything that the radiologists have uh, uh, introduced has pushed for this uh, type of uh, 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 orthopedic development. And this here is an OR. And this is an OR, which is a CT scanner being wheeled into theatre in a patient who's had spinal surgery. The reason why it's been wheeled in is so they can identify where the implants need to go within the spine. And so the idea of this is that a robotic arm then will get wheeled in the side once they've uh, isolated where everything needs to go, and that arm then precisely puts screws and rods within the spine. These can be done through stab incisions, so no big large incision in the spine is required, and end up with results like that. So that's quite a dramatic uh, procedure for a patient uh, uh, who uh, requires a spinal surgery. Other advantages that we've had, particularly with our CT scanning, uh, 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 is developing images which can then be made into uh, implants, which can be impl implanted into patients who have large and significant defects. So here we can see a patient, good hip replacement on the right side, but there's nothing on the left side. You see the big hole there where there's been considerable destruction secondary to infection of this joint. And one of the ways of dealing with that is using a CT scan to develop an image, to develop a model, and then take that model to the workshop and 3D print it. And once you've 3D printed it, insert it into the patient uh, in a precise manner. This technology has been available in Christchurch for over two to three decades, and is something we do uh, routinely. Also, the same can be said of tumors. So I've got a big hole in the bone, you can fill that hole with a specially designed implant. There have been other advances, and this is where I'd like to leave us with this type of technology. This technology is called mixed reality in medicine technology. It's just not going to work. Oh, here we go. So we have special um, goggles, which will uh, give us some sort of... Uh, holographic image and allow us to see what's going on within uh, the uh, operating room environment. We can see there's been a templated um, uh, uh, preoperative uh, plan for surgery. The patient, uh, the, the surgeon then can look at where he wants to put the implant in the shoulder. This is a shoulder joint. And for those of you that are a little squeamish, you are going to see some blood in a moment, so just be careful. And then once the implant has been planned and everything looks satisfactory and the surgeon's happy with it, the surgeon who's in the back of the audience today uh, is going to implant it by taking this holographic image. So you're going to take a holographic image from the centre of the operating room, move it across and place it in the operative field to make sure that he has everything precise and that the, uh, the um, implant has been inserted in the appropriate uh, position and the appropriate uh, place in the shoulder. I'll leave that there. And I would like to introduce Nami here, who is from Stryker, and she's going to give you a little demonstration of what we can do with these holographic images. So I'm going to stand here, is that right? So you'll see that she's... 
being silly over there in the corner. <laughs> and that's what it looks like, a surgeon who's out of control in the middle of the <laughs> operating room. Uh, so this is a surgical pan, which is based off a CT scan. Um, and the surgeon will do the pre-planning on their software. And then they'll, once it comes down to operation time, they'll load this onto their, uh, these are hollow lenses, Microsoft hollow lenses, so they load them onto the lenses and they get to wear these um, while they're operating. Uh, so what it, it does is it increases the uh, precision um, and accuracy of the, of the operation. Uh, this is the, re the beginning of uh, using this sort of technology uh, with the lenses, and no doubt in a few years' time, these will just be like sunglasses or something like that that the surgeons could put on in the operating theatre. But I'll show you uh, what we do. We just started doing this a little bit in Christchurch recently. Um, so uh, we can press here, start clone view. So if you can see in front of me, I've got a clone image, so I can grab this image, and then I can take it over to Gary. Um, <laughs> it onto the shoulder here and then I can pin that into place. So uh, surgeons can do this in real life in the operating theatre um, and you can see here for example you've got the, the um, can you see that alright? Yeah there we go. Um, uh, you've got the green, can everyone see that? Or? Yep, yep, there we go. Um, and then that will show the surgeon where they, they need to take uh, their, their cut with their saw blade. Um, and so it increases the precision of their cuts around the shoulder, which uh, helps with the longevity of implants and, and, uh, and outcomes. So, good. Great, thank you. Thank you. So this <laughs> technology is... <laughs> This technology is going to be available at the end of the session if anyone would like to come down and have a little play with it. Thanks very much, Gary. Gosh, uh, and Nami, that was a wonderful mm. demonstration. Uh, and as Gary said, you can come down perhaps, uh, there might be a bit of time at the end to come down and have a wee go. Uh, it's incredible where it's all heading really, isn't it? Well, Professor Tim Woodfield, he, he's a professor of regenerative medicine in the Department of Orthopaedic Surgery and Musculoskeletal Medicine, the same department Gary heads. Uh, Tim heads the multi-award winning and internationally respected Christchurch Regenerative Medicine and Tissue Engineering Group, called CREATE, and is director of the University of Otago Centre for Bioengineering and Nanomedicine. His research platform involves development of novel bioinks and bioresins, biofabrication, spheroid bioassembly and additive manufacturing of medical devices applied to regenerative medicine of cartilage and bone in patients, advanced 3D in vitro tissue culture models and high throughput screening. The team's work's already benefiting New Zealand patients, as Gary said, with bioinks and the 3D tech delivering bespoke surgical solutions for patients with complex fractures and as Gary just showed you, gaps in the bone. Tim's published over 160 peer-reviewed journal articles and received numerous awards and fellowships, and his work means he's at the very cutting edge of advances in bioengineering and therefore surgery. Tim? Kia ora koutou, kou Tim Woodfield tōku ingoa. Um, it's fantastic to be able to talk to you, and uh, it's nice that I'm up last because uh, what I'm going to be talking about is, um, is really at the intersection of all the different topics we've talked a little bit about. So, um, what I'm going to be talking about is the future of how we go about designing different types of implants. Um, but it involves a little bit robotics, uh, it involves surgery, it involves development of implants, but also a convergence of different types of technologies to work out how we can uh, progress some of those forward. And what you'll see is that actually the future of where implants are going isn't necessarily going towards um, metal implants. Where the future is going is towards, uh, towards ways of regenerating some of these damaged tissues. So what I am going to try to talk about is, is, is about getting personal. So how do we also then personalise everything that we're doing about the development of implants so it's just exactly for you, the patient. I'll be talking a little bit about um, 3D printing and in particular bioprinting. And so that's one of the technologies I'll be explaining today. And essentially what that is, is a way of being, a way of being able to put down um, information or put down um, layers of material uh, in a layer by layer fashion to create a really complex shape. 
So I wanted to start with one example. So as Gary mentioned, um, hip replacement is, is one of the um, uh, leading technologies. But um, where uh, 3D printing, and in particular this convergence of both imaging and now also 3D printing, has really um, exploded, uh, and where we see some of the um, major breakthroughs has been in the development of custom implants. And none so more in this particular case. So I'm probably just going to give you a lot of different examples and case studies throughout this talk. But this is a, this is a hip replacement. And what you'll see, um, sorry, this is a, a, a pelvis. And this is a CT scan like, um, like Gary and also a Tracy have showed before. A CT scan of a hip. And this is important because what you'll see is there's a large red area. And that large red area is important because that's actually identified as a region that needs to be uh, removed. Uh, because of a large tumour. So this large lump here is, is a large tumour that's uh, sitting in this, uh, in this pelvis. So actually the outcome for this patient, you can imagine if you have this large amount of bone removed from the pelvis, the outcome for this patient was actually full hind limb amputation. Because there's, there's no bone remaining. So this is um, one example where um, 3D printing, so taking the imaging platform, so imaging the patient information, being able to then look at 3D printing, and in this case, using high energy uh, laser melting of titanium powder to create um, an anatomical shape of the patient's um, uh, pelvis. So you'll see that there's a large component here which is accepting the, 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 the hip component and then reconstruction of the remaining uh, parts of the hip out of titanium uh, and screw fixation which can all be pre-planned in the surgery. So this is this convergence of how we can take imaging of the patient then able to 3D print a patient specific implant which provides the anatomical shape, so it's exactly matched to that patient. And then the outcome is that this patient underwent essentially a, a standard hip replacement surgery. So the outcome is now taking this patient from uh, a full amputation of the limb to then essentially uh, the same recovery as anyone that would undergo a full um, a standard hip replacement. So this is where the technology is actually starting to make major impact and major outcome for patients. The key for this is that, of course, these surgeries go faster in terms of how we would like our surgeries to go, so it's, there's, a, there's major cost savings and, and improvements in terms of how we're able to go about um, uh, 3D printing. But as Gary mentioned before, um, you know, th there's, there's a burgeoning number of, of cases that we're trying to have to deal with. And again, if we try to have a bit of a look at um, some of those facts and figures, again, you could try to look at um, Michelangelo's David in the 21st century. Um, there's a number of different regions. We, we've obviously got aging population, but we've got um, yeah, uh, increasing factors such as obesity and putting a greater demands on all of our joints. And as Gary mentioned, we have this epidemic in degenerative joint disease. So if we look at some of the numbers of implants that potentially need to go in um, before 2030, a bit under 300% here you know, in New Zealand, um, a little bit under 700% increase in, in the United States. And so um, the numbers of surgeries and the types of implants uh, going in is, is dramatically going to increase. But also that means the, the numbers of failures or the, the greater number of problems that we'll see. I'll put up just some other little facts and figures here. And, and the, the point here isn't to look at this in a lot of detail, but what this is trying to put into bands, and this comes from the New Zealand National Joint Registry, is actually the cause for knee revision. So the reason when a, when a knee implant might go wrong, what are some of the causes of that? And there's a number of different reasons uh, that we can have wear and other bits and pieces like this, but the big red bars are the main one that seem to be increasing over time. So between 1999 and now all the way out to 2013, the, the bars in the red section are getting uh, bigger and bigger. And um, I can tell you that the red bars represent infection. So infection is now becoming a big issue in terms of why some of these different types of implants fail. So less about the implant, but um, more of an issue around infection. So what I've mentioned to you before is that we're trying to make these personalized implants, and we've made them personalized so far by 3D printing them in titanium, and that gives them a specific shape just for the patient. But in the future, we want, our, we want smarter implants. We, want, we don't want just the shape. We want more than just shape. So what we want is we want personalized shape, but also personalized bioactivity. And I'll give you some examples of what I mean by bioactivity. So here we have, we might have our 3D printed implant. But one thing we can try to address is inf infection control. So what can we add to that implant? So for example, can we have some sort of gel which incorporates an antibiotic or some sort of biofilm inhibitor? that can be released to basically mean that that implant won't become infected in the future. Other types of things, particularly for oncology cases, so cancer cases, um, revascularization and bone growth into these um, uh, in, in patients that have had chemotherapy or radiotherapy is really compromised. 
So what can we add onto these orthopedic implants? So for example, in terms of also a gel or certain cells that would stimulate blood vessels to start to grow and allow that implant to really integrate into bone. So that's a whole um, new uh, future field. <clears throat> One area where we're seeing AI and also other areas of, of computational modeling is around trying to also predict the loading. So um, here we're talking about particular types of implants where we can make structures which are porous and which match the patient's own bone. So for example, we could take a 120 kilogram rugby player and design an implant that not only matches the shape that we're trying to fix, but then also the loading microenvironment. Because all of our tissues respond to load. So if you jump up and down or you go up into space, then your bone density will change. So the idea is that we can personalize each of our implants, not just to shape, but also to the loading that starts to go through it. So if we've got an 80-year-old female patient that, you know, that might have um, a fractured neck of femur or something like this, we can start to look at designing an implant that's going to match that 80-year-old female patient, for example, not a 120 kg rugby player, for example. So these are the ways that we can start to tailor not only just the shape, but also the loading. I'm going to shift gears a little bit now, but the idea is that what I've talked about is printing um, titanium, so permanent um, materials. What our group is focusing on is in regenerative medicine. So this is actually trying to use the body's own regenerative capacity to look at ways of uh, repairing some of these damaged um, uh, tissues or joints. So what it, what it basically involves is taking patient cells which are responsible for making new types of tissue. And if we can put those cells in the right environment, those cells will want to try to make tissue. So for, for example, we might have cells that make cartilage or cells that make bone or cells that make blood vessels. The trick is, is that the cells need to be in the right microenvironment and the right organization for them to actually start doing anything. <clears throat> So this is basically the field of regenerative medicine. So it's the science of trying to combine cells, so stem cell biology, then with um, uh, printing or bioprinting technologies to develop uh, complex tissues. So this is our vision for um, how uh, we might go about printing um, cartilage and bone. So this might be a surgery. Here we've got a large defect in the knee. You can then use uh, MRI or CT imaging to get a really good image of exactly what that defect might look in the knee. <coughs> We can then send that information to our uh, 3D bioprinter, which could be sitting in surgery or adjacent to surgery, and then allow that 3D printer to be able to fabricate a, a specific implant right there and there in surgery. <coughs> what these 3D bioprinters are designed like is that they've got a number of different bio inks. So just like you have your printer that might have different color inks, we can have different bio inks. So each different bio ink, for example, here could con contain stem cells which are primed to differentiate into bone and then you print those bone layers. Subsequently, you can then print layers of cartilage, which are a different type of cell that give that lovely, smooth, uh, articulating cartilage on the top, and that can be then re-implanted back into the patient. So this is the patient's own cells, the patient's own living tissue, which will then uh, form part of a regenerative capacity. So at this stage, we wouldn't necessarily need a titanium implant in the future because you're regenerating that damaged or diseased tissue. So what we need to make these bioprinters work is that our bioprinters are these amazing um, machines. They're kind of like Ferraris. <clears throat> but what we've been doing in bioprinting in the field so far is we've been taking a little two-stroke uh, lawnmower engine and trying to put it into these machines because these machines need bioinks to run. And so what we need is we need the Ferrari of all of our bioinks to go with the Ferrari of, of all of these um, bioprinters. And so what I mean by a bioink is essentially it's a material that you can put cells into and print and the cells remain viable. <coughs> so these have to be materials that are essentially a hydrogel or sort of tissue-like material that works at 37 degrees. The cells remain happy, but it's most importantly an environment where the cells can then actually start making the type of tissue that we want. <coughs> so it's this compromise in terms of having uh, an environment, and this is where this sort of our science goes into the biomaterial science or how we design these bioinks to make them cell friendly and also load properly. So one of the types of materials that we're using is that we're trying to use light as a, as a way to try and e engineer these bioinks, which are primarily made of, of gelatin, which is sort of another form of, of collagen, which is what makes up most of the tissues in our body. Some of you might work with gelatin. Of course, if you heat it up, it, um, it dissolves. Um, and our body at 37 degrees, we don't really want uh, different types of uh, bioinks that are sitting there that might go all soft. 
So we use some clever chemistry to try to essentially light or cross-link these types of materials. And what you'll see is essentially the, the material at 37 degrees that has been cross-linked with light uh, remains, whereas um, other ones don't. So essentially what that means is that we can now put cells into this hydrogel gelatin material, um, we can cross-link it with light, and we can implant it, and it will remain, and it will, it'll have its nice stable properties, which is what we really want. Basically, what we've been able to do is apply this sort of Ferrari of bio-ink platforms to a range of different ways of doing printing and create um, important structures which allow us to then fabricate really nice um, fidelity features uh, and allow us to place cells exactly where we'd like to be able to go. So some of the things we've tried to develop, just like the video I showed you before, so this is actual tissue, so this is actually cartilage tissue that's formed in one of the cartilage bio-inks that we've fabricated, and we've been able to layer that down in different types of layers. This then shows the red stuff is actually um, new bone formation, so calcified um, mineralized bone, so we can able to print a bone bio-ink. And this is a vascular network formation that's been able to form in a vascular bio-ink. So we're starting to combine all the things that we need for vascularized bone and then also cartilage into lots of different layers. So what does all of this mean? Is it means that we can make these personalized and quite bioactive um, uh, implants. But what it also means is that we can try to take things in terms of what we've done in terms of translational, sorry, traditional medicine, where we do some basic research and we apply it sort of in one cohort or in, in one clinical study. But because we've got these robotic ways of, of fabricating lots of little tissues in a lab, lab environment, even if we're not making um, implants, is that we would really like to apply these technologies to also personalize it towards the patient. So we can also pre-screen whether a patient's cells are going to be good or again, what type of bio-ink is going to provide them with exactly the right microenvironment. Or again, um, we can look at different um, uh, um, ethnicities, um, sex, um, age-related factors, and really incorporate all of those things into the design of our implants. And that's where we can also use machine learning and AI to start to com combine all of these complex topics. <clears throat> One way that we can make things very personalized, and one example that I just wanted to try to show you about was around um, fat grafting. So this is where we can take um, fat, uh, graft tissue from the patient and relocate it back, and, and autograft or grafting is a, is a very common um, procedure used in surgery. And this is particularly important if we wanted to look at um, fat grafting or reconstruction uh, in plastic and reconstructive surgery following mastectomy or pa um, patients that have had um, breast cancer. And I wanted to try and show this because um, we make this very personalized in the fact that this is tissue that has come from the same patient, so it's often lipoaspirate tissue, and we want to try to use it to try to reconstruct damaged or diseased tissue um, or to reconstruct shape following um, mastectomy or surgery uh, to have um, tumors removed. And one of the main problems when we look at grafting tissue is it doesn't always remain or it doesn't keep its structure. And so what we're doing here in a personalized way is that we're able to use the same light technology to improve the structural stability of the lipoaspirate before it's injected. And the impact of that now means is that we can have, the surgeon can have better control exactly where they're able to lay down these layers of, um, of adipose or lipoaspirate tissue. And the, the benefit for, for the patient or um, these breast cancer patients is that often this procedure requires four or five or six surgeries. And if we can get better stability, then we can potentially remove or um, significantly reduce the number of surgeries. So this is this nice combination between how we can control the type of tissue specific for that patient uh, and understand how we can um, uh, improve outcomes to make sure that we can end up with a great reconstructive solution. My very, very last slide really is just to sort of say on this campus we have this um, really amazing <coughs> environment where we can work obviously um, carefully with, directly with surgeons, but also with a um, number of different technologists as well as uh, bioengineers. And it's really important as we're growing these new technologies that we're also able to train and advance and bring all of these amazing um, different multidisciplinary fields and also researchers uh, and clinicians all together. So um, um, that's the end of my talk, and um, I'd like to thank you very much. Gosh, eh? Lot to think about. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, Alex here is going to, um, he's, she's got a microphone, and any questions, she can dash the microphone to you to ask of the guys up here. Um, has anyone got a burning question to start with? Got about a uh, lady up the back. 
just to follow on from the last speaker, how long would it take to grow one of those BioLink implants? Um, thanks for the question. Um, if we would like to grow a tissue, sorry, I'll stand up and then I can see. Um, if we would like to grow a tissue in a lab and then implant it, it can take uh, a matter of weeks, up to months. Um, what we would like to do, or the strategy I was trying to show you, is that we can do the surgery, or we do the approach where if we're able to print, we can print in surgery, and, and essentially all of the tissue maturation and growth happens in the body. So the body is the best incubator, the best bioreactor available. So um, our job as tissue engineers is to make sure that all the cells are happy and that they're protected and they're not going to get damaged. Um, again, when an when, uh, orthopaedic surgeon is also out with his hammer um, placing, it, placing it in, but uh, mostly because of the patient. We'd like the patient up and walking around and putting load, load through it. So that, that's our strategy. Um, there's lots of different ways of doing it, but the idea is that that implant could go in and then gradually over maybe six months to a year, the materials that are used to house or support all of that will all degrade away while the new tissue is all growing in. So um, that's, that's the main goal, is to try to keep the, the length of time that you're actually making it to the to a real minimum. Good. Uh, this gentleman over here, Alex. Thank you. Um, a question of the uh, balance between technology and the morality or ethics. So how to uh, keep our morality and the knowledge of ourselves uh, evolving, upgrading fast enough to cope with the development, faster development of technology. Two examples, I heard that, correct me if I'm wrong, I heard that the, the Australia indigenous people, they can, uh, they got strong GPS in, in the brain and very skillful at the, you know, the medical function of the plant. Meanwhile, they think the, the female in, during the period is contagiously dirty. Another example is that uh, if we can have the personalized uh, understanding of individual uh, health monitor stuff like that at individual level, do we still need the policy to distinguish patient according to their group at a group level? Okay, so very simply. So the morality and the technology. Thanks very much for that. That was a fairly detailed question, but I think the, the issue of integrating artificial intelligence into society really is a, a massive moral question, and I, I don't think I can answer that for you, to be honest, here tonight. But I think we have to be cognizant of both the advantages and the disadvantages of artificial intelligence, and we do have to be nimble and agile with our regulatory processes so they can keep up with that, basically. And as I alluded to in my talk, I think society is starting to appreciate that. And, you know, I, I think if you look at AI across the health system, um, it, is going to, it is going to gain pace. And I saw a really good graphic the other day which basically looked at what was, where it was predicted that AI would affect you from basically the cradle to the grave. And it was in nearly every aspect of, of patient care. It's, it's looking at you know, data science modeling, it's looking at diagnostics, it's looking at therapeutics that we've dealt with tonight. So it's not something we can ignore. You're absolutely right. We need to address the moral issues around it. But I think as a society, we are starting to, to realize that in, in the summit I talked about in my talk's a good example of, um, of how that's happening. I think we can expand it a little bit from there because it's the morality and the ethics around stem cell harvesting and stem cell use also of tissue engineering is an important discussion topic, Tim, and you you might like to talk on that briefly. I can talk briefly. Obviously, there's a range of different cell sources we can, we can, um, uh, we can utilise, and again, some of those can be from the patient, some of them can be from donor patients, so the question is, you know, um, again, also for different ethnicities and beliefs and cultures, um, you know, we want to be developing technologies that are available for all. That's the whole idea around sort of personalised medicine, and our question is, well, well, what works for who, what works for which cohort of patient? Um, that's where, um, again, a lot of those co-development things need to be, um, need to be uh, uh, well considered. So, 
Um, yes, I think it's really important. And I think, again, with the development of a lot of these really new technologies is that the, the regulations or potentially the, the ethical um, considerations don't always, or you're trying to essentially develop them at the same time as the technologies. And so this is something we also have to carefully balance, that sometimes technologies are jumping ahead of, uh, ahead of the discussions. And, and so that's what's important in society, I think, also is to make sure, like, like Tim was saying, we have we have those discussions and that we're aware of them and, and keep constantly pushing forward to make sure that, again, we're not developing technologies um, without full consideration, but that we're then also not stymieing or, you know, um, stopping innovation. Uh, so, again, it's this, it's this um, yeah, delicate balance that's, that's always a challenge. Thank you to all of you. It's been incredibly interesting. Uh, just some thoughts uh, or a question around the regenerative uh, medicine side of things. Do you envision a time in the future where we will be printing whole personalised organs? And what does that mean for the likes of organ donation? Is it going to become a thing of the past? Um, no, thanks. I think it's a really interesting question. Um, organs is a, is a difficult one. Um, at this stage, what we're, what we're able to do clinically and again, when I say we, I mean the entire field internationally. Um, uh, there's a large number of groups focusing regenerative medicine are able to make um, smaller sections of tissue, so sort of on the centimetre scale. I think when um, bioprinting and things first hit the scene, that they are actually already predicting by, t by 2020 we'd be able to bioprint organs. Um, and it's extremely challenging. Again, these are very, very large, complex, um, multicellular systems, highly vascularised, and the scale of... of when I say scale, actually the, the small scale of things like microvasculature that's required is, is, is um, monumental. So it's, it's a huge engineering task. Basically, that's a long-winded way to say, um, I personally feel that, that regenerative medicine of organs will be a, will be a massive challenge. Um, that's not to say that I don't think that we will address it, but I think it's a long way away. Um, and we need to, you know, we can really focus on some of the, the slightly earlier wins to really drive um, where the technology is able to try to go. But um, absolutely, it, it could be one of those ones where we're able to repair small sections of organs or, again, small sections of heart tissue. So, for example, if an infarct infarcted tissue, we might be able to repair that small little section that's been damaged. You know, th those are the things where I think there's huge opportunities. Um, um, but, yeah, I'll, I'll keep my fingers crossed, but poss possibly not. Possibly not in, in my lifetime, but uh, yeah, it would be amazing if we could. Probably got time for one more question. Thank you uh, for some very interesting talks. I wonder um, if it's possible to reflect on how we might uh, mitigate any unintended harms and that gap between what can be done and what should be done. Thinking in, in surgery so we don't see um, another pelvic mesh um, problem. And with imaging, we know the more um, detailed and, and uh, intensive we can get with our imaging, we risk finding incidental omas, and you're probably familiar with the acronym VOMIT, Victim of Medical Information Technology. How do we, how do we mitigate that with our rush forward um, in technology? Anyone think you can? <laughs> you got them stuck. That, that's a, a pertinent question because uh, technologies are evolving and we need to um, monitor them. And so the way, particularly with joint replacement surgery, that's really what I'm talking about because that's my gig basically. Um, we monitor that with our registry in New Zealand where we, we, we take every single joint that's done in New Zealand, it gets registered and it gets followed. So I think having registries to follow what's happening with these new technologies is important. If we see a problem, then we can react rapidly with those registries. Um, that doesn't mitigate the people that may have problems from that technology that, you know, that happened early on. So unfortunately, that's part of the price we pay for new technologies. Um, and we really only know the value of them and the outcomes with time. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, on, the, on the imaging side, I mean, with new imaging technologies and um, more sensitive tech, uh, imaging technologies, I mean, I think we have these conversations all the time within our group. Um, a, you're completely correct in that 
we can pick up new things. I mean, when it's a, when it's a new imaging technique, our first question is, what in the world is this? Is this, is this actually real, or is this an artifact, the technique? And there's a fair amount of trying to sort out which of those it is. Um, once, once you're beyond that and we have enough you know, evidence and knowledge to suggest, well, maybe this is something incidental, maybe this is something that needs to be followed clinically, then obviously we have conversations with clinical colleagues, but it's still not a, uh, especially in the new techniques, it's not a very uh, black and white answer. Um, and again, I'm, I'm unable to give you a wonderful answer about what we're doing about it, but it certainly is an issue and we certainly talk about it talking about a lot. Yeah. A lot of those uh, ethical issues about we can, should we, or if we are able in the future to do it, is it morally right? That's all the questions. And of course there's affordability as I mentioned earlier. We in New Zealand, will we get this? When will we get this? How far behind other countries? A lot of what the, the guys have spoken about today, particularly with some of the surgical stuff and the implants and the bioprinting, it's happening now, isn't it? in hospitals in Christchurch, a lot of this. So it's futuristic, but it's actually future now, some of it. So it's, it's, it's very exciting. Um, all right, um, as I said, the, the guys will be down here and Nami and the headset will be down here for a little bit afterwards. Uh, but basically, um, thank you all for coming. Uh, Nami Hinui Ka Kita Ano, um, go safely and uh, have safe travels home and thank you all very much for coming.